there were some dramatic games in the tie breaks of round three of the FIDE World Cup. And I'm going to take you through one of those games. So this is the matchup between Anish Giri and Jeffrey Siong. Now, Anish Giri, he's only 25 years old, but he's been in the world's top 10 for, well, I don't know how many years now. Long time. But he's facing Jeffrey Siong, who's only 18. It's not so often that uh, Anish is the old man in, you know, top level chess. Uh, but it's a tricky one for him. You know, the young guys are, are having a go at him. So they drew their first two classical games. They drew their two 25 minute games in the tie breaks. And then they went into a mini match of two 10 minute games. The first one was drawn. I have to say, all these games were very tense, certainly not uh, mild at all. Uh, particularly this first 10 minute game was uh, an incredible struggle which switched back and forth. So anyway, all is even going into this second 10 minute game with Anish Giri with the white pieces. And it's uh, a modern from Jeffrey Siong. Now I find this interesting, you know, that shows he's absolutely not afraid of Giri playing, you know, a really adventurous opening. He just doesn't, you know, he's not content just to block. Um, I mean, you could say here that maybe the most testing move is to play c4 and to go into perhaps some kind of King's Indian, but well, Giri preferred to play more modestly with bishop e3, maybe you know, a full-on King's Indian, a d4 opening, maybe it's not in absolutely his thing. So now we've transposed back into a pits, but somehow this line with the knights on two two knights out and, and bishop on e3, well, it's it's respectable for white, but I wouldn't say the most challenging from black's viewpoint. And you can play this in a, in a number of different ways. Um, knight c6 is certainly the most provocative way of playing. You don't have to. You could play c6 there, for example. But this starts to, well, it invites white to play d5. Of course, black wants to play potentially e5 in this position. But d5 is obviously the most testing move to push that knight away. Now, Giri has experience with this position before. He's had a couple of games against Aronian. Well, Aronian played knight b4, uh, continuing this kind of provocation. And, well, that, that was only um, a blitz game, but uh, Aronian won that one. But Sion played knight b8. And this was played by Duda against Giri in uh, Dortmund 2018. So... Geary wasn't phased by this, you know, he was continuing to play very quickly. So in this position, Duda played e5, uh, but Siong went c6 instead. And the bishops were exchanged. And here, Geary went for it with Castle's queen side. Obviously, you know, that raises the stakes when you have kings on, on uh, opposite sides of the board. If one wanted to play a little bit more cautiously um, and in a positional way, then I quite like h3 actually to prevent this bishop coming to g4. Because that bishop on c8 is a little bit problematic. It doesn't have a, a good diagonal to go to. And white retains the option of castle and queenside, but might also go kingside after the bishop moves obviously but castle's queenside well you know let's let's try and use this sort of lead in development and, and attack black's king why not Sion exchanged and played bishop g4 now that's why i wanted to play h3 because bishop g4 just clears clears the decks for black and, and speeds up development but white is developing quickly too, and yeah, this rook comes to the e-file, and pressure starts here. 
but black has counterplay with this semi-open C file. Knight d4, so the bishop has to be exchanged, and you know the the battle lines are becoming clearer. White is going to get some pressure here and potentially some pressure on the king side as well. And this knight in the middle of the board, you never know. It uh, has the potential to land maybe on one of these squares a bit later. So white is using the space advantage, but you know, black is fighting back here. Knight e5. It looks a little bit like a, a dragon except this pawn is on d5 and, and not e4. Um, so black certainly has counterplay here. Now, Giri played a natural move here, f4, to drive that knight out. So wait, my computer likes queen g5. And then it's possible just to bring the, the king back. But it's not a very human move. It would be very tempting simply to give up that exchange and then drop the king back. And this is such a typical dragon exchange sacrifice, and black has very easy play here. Uh, no matter what uh, your computer tells you, um, that's not easy for white to control. So, f4. Knight comes in. And now I was astonished by Xiong's next move. He played queen b6 and simply gave up his e pawn. Well, I don't think rookie eight is a bad move, just to defend the e pawn, and then you know the, the queen can can emerge on on one of these squares. But queen b six, he's in a big hurry. So obviously mate threatens, but that gets dealt with. And then the knight hops into a three. Well, fine. There there is you know a weakness here, but why can control this? And Giri simply took the pawn on e seven. Um, which is incredible, really. And, well, you've got to watch out for knight e6 as well. Well, for the moment, Xiong wasn't phased. He played queen b4 because, uh, you know, there, there's a threat to take here, so white hasn't got time to plunge in with the knight. The knight came back to protect its brother here, and then rook c5. So, well, black has... You could say some compensation in that black is very, very active here. But somehow with this rook on e7, it does feel as though white should be all right here. Now, Giri, I think very understandably, played the queen up to d4 to offer an exchange of queens to potentially drive that queen back. But queen e3 looks like a better move with a couple of ideas after rook, the rook comes over either rook d4 to drive the queen back or rook d3 to support the knight here but you know, this is very difficult to determine when you know you're essentially playing a blitz game time control i repeat it was 10 minutes you're given 10 minutes and then 10 seconds increment per move and in fact giri was ahead on the clock so queen d4, well if the queen goes back or exchanges, then white is a pawn up. So a5, so that means if the exchange is made, the knight would have to move and the rook breaks through. Now here, I've, very surprisingly, Giri played king b2. Um, I, I think the most natural move is to push with g4 to threaten this, and sooner or later I think black is going to have to exchange queens. But king b2, well, I mean, slightly surprising because that allows black, at the very least, to play knight c4 check, and that will probably lead to a draw. Um, but Xiong, very ambitiously, played rook c4. Remember, a draw would simply lead to a further tiebreak of a couple of blitz games, but Sion played on. Very interesting. Rook c4, queen came back, and then the rook came over to c8. Well, perhaps it's understandable why Sion wanted to play this one on. 
He is very active. And now rook c1 was played. Well, after the rook moves over here, in fact, it's possible to play queen h3. And, well, potential threat of queen e6, or indeed, uh, after this, this would actually lead to a draw by perpetual check, and so on. King here, it, it's too risky for black to come up the board. Um, the king, king would be mated soon. Um, let's go back. So, rook c8 just played. So, queen h3 kind of sneaky sliding move that not easy to spot. Rook c1 played. b5. Well, that seems a bit funny because at the moment the, the pawn can't advance, but this in fact set a very sneaky trap, which Geary failed to appreciate. He could still play queen h3 here, in this position, and white is okay, but f5. And then black broke through. Rook takes, and rook takes again. And if queen takes c3, then knight c4 simply wins the queen. The, queen, the king has to retreat, and queen takes queen. Disaster for Geary. So in this position, he had to simply retreat the queen, but now black has two knights against a rook, Importantly, it's possible to stop this kind of move here. Knight c4 check and knight e5, and that locks down the king side. And it's impossible for white to find any counterplay after this. One thing is that after rook takes knight, well, it's possible to take, but actually, queen d4, threatening a discovered check. So the king has to move, and then pawn takes rook, and that really is no chance for white. So knight e5 is just a beautiful move, uh, maneuver from uh, Sion. Giri exchanged, and played rook f1, but again this move queen d4, with a threat of a discovered attack, and now knight d5. Once the king's been dragged here, then there's possibility of a check here. The knight also threatens the rook. And after this, well, a neat little tactic. Rook d3. So that just vacates the c3 square. So after this, well, pieces were exchanged. And, well, in this position, Black is basically a piece up. Um, if uh, Giri didn't take on f7, of course, that rook would have been on prees at the end of all this. So, a convincing victory in that game, actually. Um, well, I say convincing, of course, Giri had his chances, but, well, let's put it another way. I think a really bold um, game from Jeffrey Siong, who really um, wasn't afraid to play you know, an adventurous opening, the modern, and then wasn't afraid to sack pawn and just kept going. And this initiative, well, Geary couldn't control it. So Anish Geary is knocked out of the World Cup and Jeffrey Sion, 18 years old, I mean, he's been playing incredibly well over the past year. I remember seeing him at the Isle of Man open uh, last autumn where, you know, he had an excellent result and he just seems so cool um, let's see how far he can go in this world cup remember if you're not a subscriber then click on that subscribe button now. and if you want to support us do check out the links to patreon.com and paypal as well thanks for watching